All right, Father, we pray for your message today. That's what's important. And then, Father, I'm asking you because we need to see the power of God heal, deliver, and restore people today. In Jesus' name. Amen. We believe for it. Okay, I title of today is called The Reward, you know what a reward is, don't you? Of a grateful heart or spirit, if you like, all right? Now, listen to this statement. Thankfulness is the key of life. Gratitude is the key that turns your situations around because it changes you, your outlook, your attitude. Now, in Luke chapter 17, there's a story there that you would have heard many times, maybe, how Jesus healed 10 lepers, okay? What was disappointing to him, however, was the lack of thankfulness from the former lepers. Only one turned back and came to Jesus and thanked him for his tremendous miracle. Only one. Now, it says in Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to 19, now it happened as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself to the priests. And so it was, as they went... They were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at the feet of Jesus, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Now Jesus was shocked, and he asked, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner, the Samaritans were considered as foreigners, all right? And he said to him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you whole. Now, the unfortunate result was that 90% of the lepers missed the second more important gift Jesus had planned for them. The one that returned got 100% healed. The others were healed. Now, I've seen leper colonists, and we have film of it, get healed in India. Right? Now it's amazing because when I see those pictures now, I notice the women were the ones that got happy and more joyful than the men. Oh, the men received the miracles, but the women really broke into tears, joy, tears of joy, and were thankful. We need to be more thankful for what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross of Calvary. He set us free. Now, most people will believe when they come to an understanding that salvation is real. You know, once you've been saved for a while, God's touched your spirit, you know it's real. Especially if you continue to read the Bible or go to a church where they teach you the word of God. But what about the other two things? The Bible says, Isaiah 53 tells you, other scriptures tell us, that when Jesus died on the cross, he became a curse for us. He broke the curse of sin, which includes first sin, right? Sickness and poverty. That's the main curse. Jesus died for all those things and plus other benefits. But they're the main ones that cover most of our life situations. So that grateful one Samaritan, he responded. And Jesus said, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about the other nine who failed to praise God. Yet it's clear from Jesus' response that thankfulness was the only proper response to the miracle. All right? Now, I'm telling you right now, there is power in a thankful heart. When we talk about your heart, it's not the beat. It's your spirit in there. We have a spirit, the soul, right, and the body. Now, thanksgiving brings contentment. I want you to keep listening today because if you follow these principles, you'll see your miracles of what you need in life come much quicker. 
All right? Discontentment dries up the soul. Now, we have so much to be grateful for in this life, each and every day. But reality is that sometimes constant life demands, all the struggles, all the worries, give more room to defeat than a heart of thanks, don't they? Or we sometimes forget, in the midst of being busy everyday life, all the pressures just to pause and give thanks for all that God has done and continues to do in our lives. Now, sometimes it really is a sacrifice to offer praise and thanks. You know why? We often don't feel like it. Our feelings can be very strong, right? You hear a bit of bad news, or a friend or a neighbor, one of your own family, that hurts. Or maybe we feel like God doesn't really care about what may be troubling us. Now listen, but we have a choice every day to give him thanks. And with a heart of thanksgiving, no matter what we face, we need to realize that God does not just work to change our situations and help us through our problems. He does more than that. He changes our heart, spirits. His power through our hearts of gratitude and minds that's focused on him releases what we could call the grip our struggles have over us at times. And we all add them, all right? We become strengthened by his peace and refueled by his joy. Now, God's word is filled with many reminders of how important thankfulness is to God. Now, when God miraculously brought his people out of slavery in Egypt, they quickly succumbed to the ingratitude towards God. They grumbled, they complained and murmured every time they faced a new challenge. Now, I'm going to tell you something now, and I'm not trying to, you know, just use what's happening in the world, but you watch. You will know other Christians, and you'll find Many will start to complain and groan. What is God doing? Well, God warned us this was going to happen. Look, we've had it pretty good in this country. You better believe it. If you travel the world to see how most people live, you'd be thankful you've been here. All right? Now, I'm telling you the truth. Okay? Don't grumble. Don't complain. You are to be an overcomer. That's what God says. When God, again, miraculously brought his people out of slavery, out of Egypt, they quickly succumbed to an ingratitude towards God. They weren't thankful. All right? They grumbled. Can you believe it? They grumbled and complained. And they murmured every time they faced a new challenge. Well, I think in the wilderness you'd face a few challenges. They'd seen the Red Sea part and open. They saw their enemies drowned in front of them. If something like that happened to you, you wouldn't complain, would you? No. See, what they did, instead of thanking God for everything he'd done for them so far, their attitude prevented them from entering the promised land for 40 years. Well, the elder group had to die off first. They were the problems. The younger generation hadn't really lived too long in Egypt. You know, the ones of 20 and under. They began to follow what Moses was saying. Now, until the grumbling generation had died out in the wilderness, they couldn't enter. See what complaining can do? It holds you down. It stops you advancing to what God has got for you. Now, after God's people finally reached the promised land, God told them to create a monument as a reminder of the supernatural miracle that he did for them so they could cross the Jordan River. I'll just read to you, Joshua chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from amongst the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. Joshua carried out the Lord's commands, and he explained to the men this would serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them 
that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. That was Joshua chapter 4 there, verse 6 and 7. Now God wants to see prayers that are filled with genuine praise and thanksgiving for what he'd done in the past. Okay? He wants us to set up memorials in our hearts testifying to the provisions he's given us. Now what's the first thanksgiving you should give? Once you realize and you start to mature, you're born again. And if you're born again, you know that God's going to take care of you, whatever comes on this earth. And one day, you're going to be in heaven itself with God. And he's even prepared a mansion for you. So what's one of the first things you should be praising God for? Hallelujah, I'm born again. He's forgiven my sins. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, glory to God. You see, it's time the church said, oh, we believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, do something, use it. Use it now, because when you get before Jesus, you will give an account of what you've done with the blessings of God. Well, I went to church every week. Big deal. We should come to church. We should come to hear the word of God. Then we should be filled with the Spirit, and when God gives us an opportunity, get somebody saved. Witness to someone. Pray for them. Lay hands on them. Don't be embarrassed. You can't heal anybody, but God can through you when you believe. This would change our nation. It will change the Gold Coast. Change Australia. Can you believe it? God wants to see those genuine prayers. He wants our spirits to be filled with gratitude for his blessings. He wants to get set up memorials in our hearts, spirits, over the good things that have happened in our life. I'm sure at stages he must have made provision for you somehow. Amen? That you're aware of. See, God doesn't want to be taken for granted. He does not just want to be given our list of wants without any true desire to know him. But we're full of wants all the time. Oh, Lord, I need this, I want this, I want that. Hmm. Listen, when God answers our prayers, it strengthens our faith in him. It helps us trust in his word. And it's an expression of his love for us and his commitment to his word. Imagine how he feels when we respond to his grace and love and mercy with indifference, all right? When we face difficult times, and we're going to face some, we often become blinded by our problems and forget how God has always provided for the solutions to our past troubles, if you've been around for a while, okay? God wants to see that his past, A, did not go unnoticed or unappreciated. He wants us to come to him confidently, in prayer, gratefully acknowledging his past miracles. Amen? And we have spent time in praise and thanksgiving. We can then ask him again, help us so that our blessings can glorify him. Amen? Now, let's cover what a grateful heart can do. All right? Number one, it gets our eyes off ourselves and helps us to focus back on God. Amen? It takes our attention off our problems and helps us instead to reflect on, to remember the goodness of his many blessings and his wonderful promises to us. Health, healing, wholeness, prosperity, answers to whatever need we have. But if you don't water your faith confessions with praise and thanksgiving, your focus on the problem will continue to dominate your thinking. If you don't redirect your focus, the problem sometimes can consume you. Have you seen friends? Some of you may have been like that once. Consumed with all the problems. Amen? See, I can speak from experience. I'm not going into a testimony. I've been shot at three times from three feet away. A guy dropped on the floor and nearly died. I had to pray for him while his bandits surround him. Surrounded by 18 people. Okay, you can go. How would you like that? I know God's real. Yeah. See? Now, you gain experience as you go on with God. I'm not suggesting you go places and get shot and all that stuff. No, no, no. What I'm saying is be real in your personal life now. 
okay? In everyday life, that's what counts. That's why you lay the foundations. Start in the morning off, praise God. This is the day the Lord has made. He's Abba Father, my Father. He's watching over me. He's going to direct my path this day. His blessings are on me. See, that's not religion, that's relationship. He's your Father. That's what Abba means. Amen. So praise him for all the good things. There must be some good things he's done in your life. As you do, you come to a place where you can then begin to release your faith and receive your answers. All right, next one. Number two, praise reminds us we're not in control, but that we serve a mighty God who is in control. All right? It will keep you in a place of humility and dependency on him as we recognize how much we need him. Praise God. All right, number three. It helps us to recognize we have so much to be thankful for. Even all the little things, they're important, which often we may forget to thank him for. All right? But they really are the biggest, most important things in this life. It reminds us that God, let's say, is the giver of every good gift. All right? We were never intended to be fully self-sufficient in this life. A grateful heart reminds us that ultimately God is our protector, provider, and that all the blessings and gifts are graciously given to us. Why? To use by his hand and direction. Now, number four, a heart of gratitude leaves no room for complaining. We've got to get over the complaint, oh, this is not good. You've got breath, you've got life, and you know where you're going if the breath stops, okay? You won't be complaining then, as long as you're going to the right place. Now, it's impossible to be truly thankful and filled with negativity and ungratefulness at the same time. All right? Next, number five, it makes the enemy flee. Now, the forces of darkness, I can assure you, cannot stand to be around spiritual people that give thanks and honor to God regularly. All right? Our praise and thanksgiving will make them flee. Okay? There are spiritual forces out there too. You do know that, don't you? You don't see them, but they're there. All right, number six. It opens up the door to continue blessings. Now, we all want blessings, don't we? Of course we do. But when you like that and you're praising God, it invites his presence. This is what most Christians have missed out on. When they get into a panic, something's wrong, they might try to reach out. But it should be part of your life all the time. All right, number seven. Our spirits become refreshed then and renewed in him. God loves to give good gifts to his children. Okay? His delight is our thankfulness. He pours out on our spirit then, favor over all those who give honor and gratitude to him. That's what God does. The principle applies to far more than just receiving healing. That's good to receive healing, all right? But it's expressed by gratitude, by your faith, that will change everything around you as you praise God. God can't lie. We can. God can't. We can misunderstand. God never misunderstands. So if you grasp that by the stripes of Jesus you're healed, and you say, thank you, Father, I praise you, this disease, whatever the problem is, by the stripes of Jesus I am healed, hallelujah, glory to God, and praise him and thank him, you'll begin to change, I'm telling you. See, we've got to become grateful by faith, not by feeling. People want to, oh, well, I don't feel good about this. Don't do business with those people. Instead of focus on your pain and hurt, fill your thoughts, fill your mouth with gratitude for your life, your family, etc. Amen? All your friends, too. And for every good thing that arises in your spirit. Now, the moment you begin thanking God for all that is going right in your life, you will be well on your way out of the problem. Amen? You don't dwell on the problem. You dwell on the solution. 
and you praise God, he's getting you out. His job is to raise you up. Express gratitude then by faith. That will change everything around you. It can change your circumstances. Amen? Let me tell you a a real miracle. I've never told this one here before. I was in prison at one stage. And, you know, some of the cells have, have, have four people in. Usually they're the ones getting to the end of their time or just short sentences. And as a guy got saved, was in one of these cells. And he'd really got saved. And he went on with God when he finally got released. But two of the guys in that cell decided they were getting out. So they started cutting through the wall, you know. Had a cabinet in front of it. Where they had their little lockers and things. But they didn't make it properly. And so the next day, when the guards came around, they expected to get out that night, but they didn't. Uh, well, you know what's going to happen then. They're all going to get sentenced, get extra time, and get at least six, 12 months extra time. And then all your benefits are gone too. You end up in a worse situation. And he came out, and we were on, you know, when you first came out, you got rid of your rubbish and everything. You lined up before breakfast. And uh, he said to me, Steve, he said, I'm in trouble, man. I said, why? What have you done? He said, well, the guys in my cell, they started cutting out. I told him I wasn't interested, but you can't interfere. That's what they're doing. And uh, he said, I think I'll be disappearing. We'll all be getting in, you know, punishment and down what we used to call H division, H for hell. 19 hours locked in your cell every night, day. Yeah, bad. Anyhow, they came out. They sent everybody back back to their cells before breakfast. They were doing a full search thing, everything. Now, there's, in those days, we used to have these little things over your head, little speaker things, you know, that crackle all the time. And, you know, that's when the <laughs> radio, whatever they allowed you to hear, came through. And I thought, I need to encourage him. I need to pray with him. I didn't get a chance. I'm going to pray with him. And so I picked it up. Now, normally, that's once you're out yourselves, those are locked off. they turned off, whoever turns them off, right? And uh, I said, Doug, Doug, he answered me immediately. Now, he was many cells away from me. Isn't that amazing? I said, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to believe God is not going to, those guys will be honest and tell the truth that you two in that cell weren't involved in what they were doing. All right? And I prayed with him. Do you know what happened? The two guys fessed up that, you know, he had nothing to do with it. Him or the other guy. Saved him from getting, he only had a few months left to get out. He would have been in for another year or two years or something. See what I mean? Now, I'm telling you that only for one reason. I've been through impossible situations where it seems there's no hope, that God can do nothing, but God can. And I can stand before you today and say, why I'm strong, you know, and I'm not your average preacher, that's for sure, because I am strong. And the reason I'm strong is God delivered my life. He got me out of jail. I've traveled all over the nation, those flags. You know why? I have no record. How can that happen? That's why 60 minutes chased me. That's why all my enemies chased me. Did everything. But I'm standing before you. 50 years later from when it started, I'm here, no sentence, travel the world everywhere, and seeing God bring revival around this world. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, if I can do it, and I was hopeless, you can do it. And you've got to start believing God to move in your life, and you'll find he will move in your life. Amen? That's the truth. I got born again. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's the difference. Are you real? Have you got born again? Because you're not your old self if you have, if you're going with God. Hallelujah. Seen six people raised from the dead. Seen three leper colonies get healed in India. Seen God move so mightily. In Eastern Europe, when the Berlin Wall went down, I was the only one that went in straight away. 
My wife did encourage me to go straight away. I don't know if she's getting rid of me, but she did. Hallelujah. It was a good thing. I'm trying to encourage you. Believe what I'm saying to you today. It's amazing what God can do when somebody surrenders and commits their life to God. In Jesus' name. Amen. See? We've got to learn to express gratitude by faith. And it can change everything around you. But the principle is you've got to start doing it. If you think about it, we only have two real opportunities in times of extreme pressure. These options are to focus either on the problem or the gratitude. You cannot do both at the same time. All right. Now, I'm not saying the challenges will be over when you start filling the atmosphere with shouts of praise and thanksgiving, okay? In fact, once you begin praising God with purpose, you'll become a prime target for the devil. Now, why? Why would the devil do that? See? Because when you begin operating in gratitude, he'll try to stop you. He doesn't want you to get the success. He'll use only the tactic he possesses. He'll try to steal the word out of you by stirring up your flesh. Now in Mark chapter 4, verse 16 to 17, it tells us this. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, have no root in themselves, and so they endure, but for a time. Afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. The enemy will try to get you to become offended. It's easy to cause an offense, isn't it? If you don't smile right, somebody will get offended. But that will only work if you have no root and if you're not grounded in the love of God. All right? However, if you are loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, mind, Matthew 22, 37, and expressing your gratefulness for all that he has done, you're becoming rooted and grounded in love. That's what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. I pray that from his glorious and limited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Become so filled with his love that offenses can't come near you. Praise him for his marvelous love. Praise him. And as you do, the enemy will be stopped cold because praise stills the avenger according to Psalms 8 verse 2. Now, when you're under trouble, remember that. Don't start feeling sorry for yourself. Try and beat that. Start praising God. Well, Father, you're going to bless me. You're going to get me out of this predicament. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Learn to praise God with thanksgiving. Amen. See, you've got to fill your mouth with the atmosphere of gratitude, thanking God for all that he is. God's in control of every situation in your life, if you believe it. You and the world around you can change. Hallelujah. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 contains a passage that you probably know, some of you by heart, but look at it again. It says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord gives you strength. When the Lord spoke those words through the prophet Nehemiah, the Israelites had returned to Jerusalem and were gathering together to hear the reading of the book of the law of Moses. When they heard the perfection of the law, that was the word of God at that time, they realized how short they had fallen and they were yielding, had been yielding to condemnation. They started crying. Mourning, which is a typical reaction. Some of God's people think that if they mourn and cry, they've had a move of God. Hmm. But the Lord instructed them. I like this. Listen to this. Go your way. Heat the fat 
Drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In essence, God says, get up, get out of here. Stop crying. Celebrate with a feast of rich foods, sweet drinks. Share gifts with one another. Gifts of food to the people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected. Then he said, why were they to do this? Because the joy of the Lord was their strength. I've got news for you. The joy of the Lord is your strength too. Amen. Even medical science now knows the importance of laughter. Medical studies show that laughter is a powerful remedy for stress, pain, and conflict. It brings peace to a person's mind and body. It builds relationships with power to heal and renew. The ability to laugh easily and frequently is a tremendous resource for surmounting problems. We face, we'll all face problems at different times. So it will enhance your relationships and support both you physically and emotionally in your health. Now, laughter relaxes the body. Did you know that? Did you know good laughter is good for you? It's true. It relieves physical tensions, stress, for up to 45 minutes, they say. Now, I want you to laugh for five minutes. No. <laughs> then you'll be really happy for the next hour. Okay. <laughs> See what I mean? Now we say, oh, come on, Steve. No. These are facts. Not I made them. These are medical facts. See? It boosts your immune system. Triggers the release of endorphins. The body's natural feel-good chemicals, isn't it? We all want to feel good, don't we? All right. It protects the heart by improving blood vessels functions. Now let me ask you, is it really so far-fetched for the joy of the Lord to be your physical and emotional strength? Of course not. Amen? Remember the joy of the Lord is on the inside of you. When you rejoice and you can laugh by faith, you tap into the true joy and resist yielding to depression and fear. Their enemy is from the devil, all right? We've got to learn to resist and yield. Two of the most important things we can learn are what to yield to and what we should be resisting every day. Now, there are Christians yielding to things they should be resisting and resisting things they should be yielding to. Millions of Christians yield to depression, fear, and strife. Now, a lot of people are afraid what's going on in the world. Well, if you're a born-again believer, and you're saved, and you're filled with the Spirit, if you are, either way, you should be rejoicing. Because God has already promised us, he's told us what's going to take place. And he's telling us, before it gets really bad, some of us are going out of here. I want to be one of them. Amen? I'm sure you do. Just listen, you can yield or resist according to God's word, so you're going to know his word, and prevent the devil from getting a foothold into your life. Depression is one of the enemy's favorite weapons, and he does his best to wield it against believers. Now, you can be in a church meeting anywhere you go, surrounded by faithful believers, get full of the word. Then you go home and you get into strife for 30 minutes. You sit down and you yield to depression. Something happens. It's like someone pulled out the plug. Understand? And all the strength and the life that you received from the meeting you'd been in an hour or so before will run out of you and you'll be as weak as water. Whenever that happens, or when your peace and your joy are threatened in any way, remind yourself of this verse. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Say that a few times. That's what you should do, all right? You, that's, that's how you stir up your faith. You speak it over yourself. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, you, you will get carried away a little bit. 
That's all right. God wants you carried away in the spirit to him, praising him, giving him glory and praise. It's very important. You see, you know, at school we had to go to a traditional church, you know, Anglican when you live in England. And I remember going there. It was the most boring thing as young people I'd ever seen in my life. Glory to God. If you look like you're happy, it's like you're a sinner. No, come on, I'm being honest. To people who are not converted and don't understand, it's, a, it's bondage. They even speak like you're putting you in bondage. Amen. That's all. So don't yield to depression, heaviness, grief, self-pity. Resist it with every fiber of your being. That's what you should do. Amen. Your ministry, your marriage if you're married, your health, general well-being, depend upon it. Now you may be thinking, I already know some of those scriptures. I've heard that before. But if you are still yielding to depression, strife, or fear, then you don't really believe it. Your actions will prove whether you believe it. Amen? When the devil attacks, God doesn't look down from heaven and say, Oh no, oh my gosh, what, what's happening? No, he doesn't do that. Psalm 2, verse 1 to 4, God gives his response. Listen to this. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, Let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. When it looks like Satan is about to run over you, God laughs. That's, how, that's nice to know, isn't it? Let me give you a few other scriptures to meditate on there. Psalm 37, verse 12 to 13. The wicked plots against the just, gnashes him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The Lord, your God, in the midst of you is mighty. He will save he will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. God sings over us. Did you know that? Well, that's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Do you think he's got a special song over every one of you? Maybe he has. See, God laughs. That's good to know, isn't it? God can laugh. God rejoices. God sings. When we get to heaven, we're going to stand in God's presence. It will be unspeakable joy, full of God's glory. Now, you know, a lot of people, they think that if you are truly spiritual, then you must be serious. Hmm. They think if you're really spiritual, you must be intense. Because that's how they imagine God. But that's not right. It's not right at all. God is love and peace, goodness, grace, and yes, he's joy. I've been adopted by him. So I'm going to follow his traits. I want that kind of Christianity. That's what God wants for all of us. Glory to God. On the other end, deliberating on our negative thoughts and feelings, allowing criticism to take over our minds, that's incredibly damaging. If we constantly have negative thoughts, we build those thoughts into our mind. It affects your future thoughts then, words and behavior, because you're laying a pattern for behavior. Dwelling on negative thoughts is the biggest cause of depression and anxiety. Have you noticed how a lot of people are suffering under those images? Every time we feel pessimistic, we should practice being thankful rather than merely dwelling on our lot in life. Choosing to be grateful instead of thinking the worst in any given situation helps us see our circumstances differently and it gives us the ability to persevere, to stay positive, even when times are tough. Well, all we know, it is good to pause and realize how much that we have to be grateful for. But did you know that gratitude 
is essential too to success, whatever you're seeking. If you can't appreciate what you have to be thankful for right now, it's harder to achieve what you desire in the future. Gratitude makes us feel that life is worth living, which brings mental health. All right? Just trust God. He'll help you to bounce back through anything that's coming. He wants us to be victorious, okay? Gratitude is therefore essential to overcome difficult circumstances and achieve success in, in every area of your life. Now, we all go through hard, challenging seasons. These times are often called the midnight hour. Remember Paul and Silas? They had a midnight hour. After being flogged, Beaten, stripped, they were thrown into the inner cell of a prison, the very inner cell. With even their feet bound, it appeared all was lost. They were in chains. They weren't getting out. Now, instead of feeling defeated, this is what we should all do in a circumstance that seems overbearing, overpowerful. The Bible says at the midnight hour, they lifted their voices and they began to pray and sing hymns to God. Now there's other prisoners in the prison too. They must have heard them. All right. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Penny Prince used to start singing at midnight and people trying to sing, shut up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They heard. In the midnight hour, what probably was the darkest hour in their life, they chose to worship God and have a grateful attitude. They put their focus on God not on the circumstances they were in. And suddenly, an earthquake shook the prison. Suddenly, those chains fell off. Now, how did chains fall off when they're locked? And it fell off them. The door broke open, flew out. That's what happened. Paul and Silas were set free. We won't go into all the details, but if you know the story, they were set free. Not of their own accord, but by the supernatural power of God. And I can say, yeah, he set me free too. Hallelujah. That's good. So whatever in your life, you've all had a bit of sin, you know that, don't you? So don't look at me strange. Well, God can set you free from anything that's been a bondage to you. Amen? Praise and thanksgiving bring about suddenness in our lives. Praise God. It may be the midnight hour for you. It may be the darkest hour you've ever faced right now. But if you keep your focus on God and maintain a grateful attitude, you will see God move heaven and earth for you. Amen. Amen. But the key is to stay connected to God. It is the key. Through prayer and praise. Keep your trust in him because he will strengthen you. He'll bring you to victory. Remember, everyone else may be asleep in the midnight hour but you can always count on God because the Bible says he never sleeps nor slumbers. That's good to know. Amen. If you want to experience no good thing being withheld from you, then you have to stop complaining and start thanking God for what he's already done in your life. He said, well, I'm not too sure what he's done. Well, he got you saved, hasn't he? He's given you eternity. He's got a mansion for you. You're going to be above and not beneath. You're blessed forever, eternity. It's just a short stay here compared to eternity. It's not even a blink of the eye. Come on. We've got to get real and thankful in our hearts for what God has done for us. Amen? Amen. But you must stop complaining. Thanking God for everything in your life. I don't care how small it is. That's where you start. How could any child of God possibly think they're going to receive God's best in their life when they're constantly complaining? Have you brought up kids? You don't like to hear them complaining all the time. Oh, I don't want to go to school today. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I understand what we're saying here. Complaining is just really a bad habit. That's all. All it takes to change a decision is to stop complaining. You've got to make that decision. Stop majoring what you don't have or what is not happening. And start being more grateful for what God has already done in your life. 
Replace all the complaining with gratitude, being thankful to God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 to 7 say, As you have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in faith, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. See? We're to abound with thanksgiving. Another translation says it this way, overflowing with gratitude. You might not be exactly where you want to be in your life right now, but you still must have something, somewhere to be thankful for. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. No matter how bad your situation is, you do have reasons to be thankful, don't you? Amen? Thank God for your healing before it manifests. That's the key to divine healing, I'm telling you now. Thank God for your salvation. Thank God for all the promises in him. They're all yes and amen. Hear that? They're all yes and amen. And you get one? If the Bible says that God neither slumbers nor sleep, that means he works the night shift. That's good to know, isn't it? He's listening. He's working on your behalf. When you believe you receive, then you begin to praise God for the answer. You thank God that it's done for you. Thanksgiving and praise involve more than just speaking lovely words to God. There is power in the praise of God. Praise was ordained by God for a definite reason. It serves a purpose. It's a weapon we use in calling a halt to Satan's maneuvers. And he does maneuver around, doesn't he? Psalm 9, 1 to 4 says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. When your enemies are turned back, not if. He didn't say if, right? He says they will. That tells me whatever adversity is challenging you today, begin to praise God. Exercise this vital weapon in your warfare against Satan and all of his forces. Your enemies will have to turn back. Sickness and disease will be repelled. They have to turn back. That's good to know, isn't it? Praise God. Medical studies show that the more grateful people are, the healthier they tend to be. Remember, the God of hope fills you with all joy, and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, Romans 15, 13. And the peace and the victory that Jesus bought for you will be yours. Amen.